everybody. Um, so I've been asked to share with you my experience as a rural Nebraskan and also a emerging media artist and my journey, um, how to get from one place to another. Um, There we go. <laughs> um, so as the saying goes, but you can't take Nebraska out of the girl, right? So um, the Nebraska in me feels right now a really strong spirit of paying it forward. I'm so excited about this Carson Center because for me personally, it was really hard um, for me to feel validated in just pursuing an art career in general. And this is even a, a, an incredible opportunity for kids who are like me um, to have a place and to have that support. Um, so to that extent, I want to invoke the spirit of the pioneers of the Scottsbluff area that used to go on the Oregon Trail um, and um, head west on their own journeys. So what I did was I made my own trail. <laughs> I actually made a Google map, so if you're interested, to um, check out the map itself. It's going to be there for a while. So I actually mapped out my trail west. Um, and there's also more detailed information on it. So this was actually my trail. This is the Erica Larson Dockery Trail, is what I called it. Um, <clears throat> so my college career really just looks like a pinball machine. Um, and when I look at this now, it's really iconic of how like insecure um, I was, and also how my family was, of like where I wa what I was wanting to do and where I was wanting to go. Um, <clears throat> so throughout my journey, I had a lot of overarching obstacles, and a lot of those were faced in or based in this concept that art could really only be a hobby and not necessarily a career. And I don't know if that's based off of just being in a small rural community and being completely isolated from the art world, the technology world, but that was what I was kind of going against um, in my own pursuits. And um, so getting through this, it took a lot of time, um, a lot of mentors, and lots of perseverance. Um, so let's head on down that trail. All right. <laughs> I'm actually going to hold this so it's, I can move around a little bit. Um, so my journey starts in Scottsbluff, Nebraska, actually about 15 miles north of Scotts Bluff, so even more remote than just Scotts Bluff. Um, this was the feedlot that I grew up on. Uh, my dad, Dallas, founded it, um, Larson Feeding Corporation. We had a 10,000 head um, feedlot operation, and this is where I spent my entire non-adult life. My father, Dallas, um, was a cattle buyer from Kimball, South Dakota, and he settled down after he met this beautiful lady, this is my mom. <laughs> she was a rodeo queen, and her name is Patty. Uh, and then here's some awkward shots of me growing up. Um, but I often was seen getting into mischief with my two brothers and my sister. Um, I went to Mitchell, Nebraska for schooling, which population was about 1,000 people. Um, and being a cattleman's daughter, I ate beef eight out of seven days a week, just so you know. But I also want to talk about my media diet. So um, growing up where I did, I had this great concept of a, a country cable where I had three channels. That's all we had. We had ABC, CBS, and PBS. So I watched a lot of PBS. And some of my most influential um, sources were British comedies, um, especially Monty Python. And, specifically Terry Gilliam's animation in uh, Monty Python, um, Doctor Who, lots of Disney animation, and other like random wacky Japanese and old historical animation videos that we got from the libraries. Um, I also, oh, now they're starting. There we go. <laughs> Some of them aren't auto play. Um, one of the other things that was actually really kind of serendipitous for me was my oldest brother, Matt, is 10 years my senior, and what he would do is he'd go over to his friend's house and videotape MTV. So I actually would watch these VHS tapes on repeat until they just, like, died. So this was actually really, really great, and a lot of my introduction to animation and media was through this incredible, like, revolutionary era of MTV. <clears throat> Good stuff. Oh, oh, and Bob Ross, too. <laughs> 
Anybody else about Ross fan out here? We got, yes. Yes. <laughs> So this, like, Bob Ross literally was my first art teacher, just so you know, and probably, like, the first artist that I knew. Um, so, yeah, you got to love him. Um, so it's been 15, when I was 15, I started working with my oldest brother, Matt. That's him, and that's Matt, and that's me. And um, this was when I was actually at Lincoln later on, but I wasn't 15 in that picture. Um, so I started working with him and his business called Inventive Media, and he was, I come from a family of entrepreneurs, um, like my dad, um, but my brother Matt actually brought wireless internet to western Nebraska, eastern Wyoming area. So this was one of the first, like, <clears throat> this was one of the first iterations of his process. And so he had internet services, but he also did video production and web design and graphic design. So when I worked with him, um, he mentored me, but I also got to interact with the graphic designers that worked there, the web designers, and the video producers. So I got to learn Photoshop when I was 15. I got to learn the video toaster. Anybody have a video toaster? Uh, VHS, baby. Um, I got to learn that while I was there, too. So I, got, I was exposed to a lot of really great uh, mentors. The other thing that I learned that I think is really important is that it was here that I figured out that there was jobs that were not starving artists in the art world that I could actually think about. Because um, before that, I didn't really know that. Um, OK, so when it came to college, first thing I said is, I want to go to art school, and I want to go to California. That's it. That's it. And my mom and dad were not necessarily buying that. Um, so my dad, being the gambling man that he is, said, how about you go to UNL for two years, just like your brothers and your sister, and then we'll talk art school. And I said, OK, all right, I can do that. So for two years, this is the best picture he has. <laughs> I got to get on his case. But so for two years, I came to UNL, and I studied graphic design with Ron Bartels, who definitely was one of my mentors. He also was a graduate of CalArts and was the one who first told me about CalArts and explained how awesome I would be there and how I'd really like it. Um, I also, though, found it, <laughs> I had to add this to there, <laughs> um, but I also found it a little frustrating that graphic design was all on the computer because clearly I love to get messy and paint, um, even myself, for football games. So, um, but I, so I wasn't necessarily sure that graphic design was the fit. But here's the thing, we're talking a lot about, you know, jobs. And, and that was really the mentality that I had was, when I was talking to my parents about what I wanted to pursue, it was based off of a job. So I had to try and find an industry that I needed to be into. Not necessarily what I wanted to just do to be happy, but where I fit. How could I prove to them that I was going to make enough money and, and still be able to be happy and be artsy? So, but I wasn't digging graphic design because of, it was too much screens. So instead of going to California, <clears throat> I went to Phoenix instead and decided to study animation then. Because I felt animation was a little more, I could still draw, I could still paint, but I could still work with the computer because I really loved working with computers too. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> let me make sure I'm not forgetting something here. Yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> but still, when I went to Phoenix, I still had to sell to them that now I wanted to be in animation, like a totally an animator. I just want to be an animator. Don't worry about it. So I still had to like sell this, this concept to them. I still had to kind of make an economy around it to actually feel like it was a valid pursuit. Because um, just being an artist was not quite valid enough. Um, <clears throat> and although my dad actually told me that that two-year deal he made with me, he was actually hoping that after those two years here, I'd kind of give up on that art school thing. Um, which really stuck with me. That's like a really strong message to send to a kid of like, well, we're kind of hoping you'd give up on that. Um, but I was determined, and dang it, we made a deal. So um, I went to Phoenix, and while I was there, <laughs> I was one of two girls in my class. Um, I also interned at a CG animation studio, and two weeks before I graduated, I got hired as a motion graphics artist at a local studio there called Fuel Studios. Um, and that was 2003 that I graduated. Um, but even so, 
that situation, I was also being a little disenchanted because I was a contract hire, right? Which is a lot of what creative work is. So for me, I felt like that security that I had been like promising my parents and my family actually wasn't existing. So it was a little tough. And then the unexpected happened. Four months after I graduated in 2003, my dad passed away suddenly. So I went home. And it was fine by me because Phoenix was so hot. <laughs> Oops. Oh, it didn't play. Oh, well, OK. Did it play? Yeah. OK. <laughs> Sorry, I can't always see. Um, it was really hot, and everybody says, oh, it's a dry heat. No one tells you it does not cool down at night. <laughs> if they would have told me that, I never would have gone, and that's really major. So I went back to Scott's Bluff and had like, this really important sort of like, reflective time and really tried to figure out who I was and what I needed to do, because everything up until that point didn't seem to be working. And a lot of it had to do with because I was looking for a cog to fit into and realize that I wasn't a cog. Um, and while I was there, I made art for myself, and I remembered how much fun that was, and how much I enjoyed being an artist over just like a commercial bigwig. Um, I remembered how much I loved to teach art. I taught a little country school um, that was K through eight, and that was really great. Um, I also started my first business, Eek Art, um, which is what I would perform my freelance under. Um, so I decided, I decided two things. I decided I really love to teach kids, but working in a school system means that I probably wouldn't be able to make my own work. And that's when I sort of shifted and said, I think I need to teach like college, because that to me seems like one of the places where I can still teach, which is one of my passions, but also it supports me having an art practice. But to do that, I needed an MFA. So what I decided to do was to go back to Lincoln <laughs> and try and beef up my portfolio and then apply for grad schools from there. Um, so this was summer of 2006, and I moved here to Lincoln. And I actually began working at University Communications in their web department as an associative, an associate interactive media developer. Um, so UCOM was a whole other awesome flavor of creative work which I loved, especially being around the writers, the video people, the web people, um, the graphic design people. Are any UConn people here today? I was curious. Yes, okay. <laughs> just want to give a shout out. Um, so that fall, I had a lot of fun making work, and I just like made a lot, a lot of work. Um, and I was still thinking about how the moving image could fit back into my practice. But it was really just to build a portfolio. So in October of that same year, UCOM actually offered me a research assistantship. So if I was going to apply for the grad program, I would have a free ride. So I couldn't refuse. So I applied to the program, um, was accepted, and um, the following year studied painting and drawing with Aaron Holtz as my advisor, and Ron Bartels was still there. She was my number two advisor. Um, and again, I made a lot of work. And I also began exploring how projection could fit into with my paintings and starting to build or to meld those two different worlds that I love, the technology and the art making painting. And this was the first piece that I made. Is it rolling? There we go. <laughs> um, this is actually an animated painting. It's a painting on paper. So, um, and this person here is actually my oldest brother. He didn't quite know what to think about this piece. Um, <clears throat> But the projection is actually interacting with the painting. So the face is the painting, and the eyes and the clouds are projection that are interacting with it. Um, so you see that Terry Gilliam reference here? Yeah, you can see that. <laughs> um, so, but this also like, posed a problem with the faculty here, because they could help me with my painting, but all this animation stuff, I was kind of at a loss, because they didn't necessarily know anything. There wasn't anybody doing animation here, or this kind of interactive work. So. Um, and this is also another entry point for the Carson Center and how I'm excited that this center is actually going to help fulfill, facilitate that for future students. Um, so I decided to go to California and apply for grad school and that's when I went into CalArts. And at CalArts, um, 
at CalArts, I got into the experimental animation program and the integrated media program, which I feel like is a really great parallel for Carson Center because it's the same thing. It's an add-on to an existing degree, um, and I feel like there's a lot of possibilities there between those two. Um, though I didn't have the luxury of having a studio as I did here in Lincoln, I explored interactive work, I made games, installations, performance art, video art, and more animated paintings, and I collaborated a lot. This is some of my projection onto a dancer. Um, and then this is a clip from my thesis where I actually made an amusement park about pregnancy that had seven different rooms that people traveled through. And projection onto bodies was kind of fun. Okay, I'll keep going here. Um, I also co-founded um, San El Creative Valley Adventure Play with my husband. And what we do is create free play spaces for kids and for grown-ups. Um, on the left there is Eureka Villa, which is a 30-year abandoned park that we came across and bought that we're going to make into a permanent space. And then on the right is actually an um, example of some of our pop-ups where we just offer <laughs> cardboard boxes, tell parents not to tell the kids what to do a lot of the time, and just let them play. And I also teach at CalArts now. Um, this is a slide from the Animated Woman class, which is a class that I proposed to them two years ago. That's a research and theory-based critical discourse class on how women are represented in animation, both as characters, but also as creators. And it was written up the New York Times and LA Times last year, it was pretty great. Um, so now my last trail is this summer migration I do <laughs> back to Scotts Bluff every summer. Um, and that's because of the Calibrasca Arts Initiative, which is an initiative that I started in 2013. So every summer I come home, I have a seven-year-old, and his name is Dallas, and I wanted to make sure that he was able to grow up riding in the tractor with his uncles and irrigating and riding horses. So I knew I was gonna be coming back to Scotts Bluff during the summer. Um, but didn't want to die financially because I still have to deal with LA income and expenses. So what I started doing was, you know, I'm teaching, I'm teaching animation to these kids in LA. Why don't I start doing that in Scotts Bluff? Um, so I started doing um, animation workshops when I was back home visiting with family. And in the last couple of years, I've actually been bringing animation students with me from CalArts to come out and teach the kids too. The classes are multi-generational, so they're all ages actually have a grandmother that traditionally just like comes and learns animation with their grandkids and it's the coolest thing ever. Um, so yeah, and that really brings us to present day. Um, so my path really made me who I am. Um, and I'm really, really eager to be involved with this center. Um, and I'm, I'm so happy to share my experience as a rural Nebraskan and an emerging art pioneer. Um, I really want to stress these two points, though. I really want to stress how important it is that we focus not only on educating the students, but we also have, I think, a greater responsibility of how to educate parents and how to let them know that being an artist is actually a really great career path, and it actually opens up even more career paths than just shooting from a career path from the start. I also want to emphasize the importance of mentorship and how important it was for me to have people to show me those ropes, um, because otherwise I was just bumbling around in the dark. Um, sure. um, and I think it's a really unique challenge um, that the center has to familiarize communities which otherwise are totally isolated from art and technology. Um, but I also think that's a really incredible strength, and it's also an incredible advantage to tap into um, that to tap into that uniqueness that people aren't exposed to all of these these detail oriented um, spaces and technologies, and that we can actually begin in creating new media, new technologies, new approaches because we're working with like really fresh um, on on um, minds that are completely free and new to the idea and the concepts. Um, so really my hope is that the center creates pioneers and not just cogs in the wheels. To that, here's to the pioneers. Thank you. Thank you.